Crossroads Media. Hello, everybody. I like to have fun when talking sports, but sometimes I just get confused. Then I get angry. Then I get upset. And I'm a little upset with the Eagles right now. And I'll explain why in just a moment. But before we get to all that, hey, if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up button as well. I greatly appreciate it. You can also take me on the road with you. Hook me up to your Bluetooth in your car. Go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, any podcasting platform. Search Sports Talk with Broads. Leave a five-star rating and a review. It will go a long, long, long way with the algorithm. So thank you all so much. And last. If you're looking for more Broads Media content, you can join the memberships here on YouTube for $4.99 a month and get access to Coffee with Broads, which is live streamed every Monday and Thursday morning at 11 a.m. where we kick back here in the studio, have our coffee together. It's a lot of fun. You also get access to our Discord channel as well. So it's pretty much a chat room 24-7 with all the members. It's super fun. All the information is down below in the description. Thank you all so much for uh, clicking on this video, this pod and enjoy the show happy friday everybody good morning how's everyone doing or good evening good afternoon good night whenever you're actually listening to the pod i'm just recording this friday morning with a fat cup of coffee and that smell is percolating through my nostrils and it's an amazing feeling now what i'm not going to do i think is make this one of those screaming insane pods This is more of a, let's have a real talk. For the last six, seven months or so, when it came to Eagles football, I've been extremely negative, not by choice. Trust me, the last thing I want to do is despise the position of my football team. And it hasn't been all bad thoughts. I like drafting Quinion Mitchell. I like going up and grabbing Cooper DeGean in the second round. There were some savvy things by Howie Roseman this offseason. Getting Saquon Barkley, signing Landon Dickerson, getting my a lot of money, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith getting their bags, especially when you see what Justin Jefferson made. Joe Banner's out here throwing Twitter fingers saying, yo, uh, Devontae, go fire your agent now. Why? Because you'd rather be in a position that Dallas is in where C.D. Lamb is flipping off the entire organization saying, go screw off. I right, go shove it right up your keister. I'm not participating in anything. You'd rather be there, Joe Banner. Shut your yap. Shut your mouth. Shut up. I don't want to deal with that. You got a happy wide receiver who's a star in this league willing to take money that makes him comfortable and stay here with the Eagles to have a roster that's built to succeed and you're now going to start taking shots at people. It just doesn't add up to me. Go sit this one down, Joe Banner. But at the end of the day, I am very, very sour on the dynamic of the coaching staff. And I mentioned this before, I believe, that one of my good buddies, Stumps, and if you're listening, Stumps, I love you to death, you know that. We were at a wedding together, and he pulled me aside and said, yo, bro, let me talk to you a little bit. I've been listening to your pods. I listen all the time. There's one thing I got to tell you. Just relax on the Nick stuff. It is what it is. It's time to turn the page. And I let that soak in. I took it to heart, and I truly did listen to those words, and I understood where he was coming from. But then I hear Jalen Hurts speak, and when he had an opportunity to give the head coach love, it's a very bizarre exchange, and we'll play that in just one minute. Then I heard Brandon Graham speak, and it made me ask more questions. And essentially, the conclusion I came to after listening to Stumps was I'd be doing you all a disservice. I'd be doing myself a disservice if I pretended the Nick Sirianni drama wasn't real. The NFL head coach is one of the most important positions in the entire game. It's quarterback and head coach. And right now, Our head coach, after all the controversy, after running off the field in Kansas City, screaming at the fans, after having all these lunatic type of scenarios play out where he's doing things unconventional and he's being bizarre and he's just weird, man. He's just what a leader shouldn't be doing. 
he starts off this mini camp by pretty much looking at the media, trolling Giants fans. And part of the fan base might think that's who Nick is and he's never going to change, and it's authentic, and it's raw, and that's part of the Nick Sirianni experience, and I understand that. But then there's another side that says, you got to mature more. There's something off about Nick. And when you go through the collapse that you went through last year, if you didn't learn anything about how to hold yourself to a nice standard, right? He's a big standard guy. We play to our standards. This isn't up to our standards. Standard, standard, standard. There's a standard for you as an NFL head coach, how to hold yourself to a high regard. And if you watch yourself over the last few years, and after last year's debacle, you don't come to the conclusion that I need to clean up some areas because none of us are perfect. No matter what job you do, no matter what your occupation is, you can always adapt. You're not going to be 100% perfect. Well, in my eyes, the area that he needs to improve, and if last year wasn't a smack in the face, is all that silly nonsense. It needs to be more of a focus of, fellas, Enough with the bullshit. It's time to go. And instead, he follows that up at the start of this season in minicamp by saying, oh, yeah, I ran into Giants fans and said, we took your best player. Nick, grow up. Grow up. And maybe you think that this doesn't mean anything. Why are you wasting energy on the fact that Sirianni is having fun when he's off the field, he's at ShopRite, he's playing tennis, he's at the local park, he's in Haddonfield, New Jersey, wherever he is. What, he can't take a couple of jabs and throw a few jabs? Maybe you can. Maybe you can. But if you were just to do it without anybody knowing about it, fine. But when you take that and you apply it to your media press conferences... And then it starts hitting the market up in New York. Then they start to grab onto it. Now their sports talk radio stations are expanding it and making it bigger than what it is. At the end of the day, yeah, it's it's not the biggest deal in the world. But what happens is he isn't cognizant of what's going on. He doesn't have that, that foresight or he doesn't realize what this is going to become. And if you can't comprehend that, how am I supposed to have faith that you can comprehend turning this thing around when you have no say anymore and the entire locker room understands that, that you were stripped of all power? If it wasn't known previously and if you didn't see it prior to this mini camp I hope you realize it now and what I can't do is diminish the power of the head coach role and say that it doesn't matter that he is irrelevant it does matter it does matter because when you look at coaching advantages in the NFL can Mike Tomlin out coach Harbaugh can Mike Tomlin out coach Andy can Andy out coach McVay can McVay out coach LaFleur these are the questions that are asked and right now we have let's say week one in Brazil can Matt LaFleur out coach nobody huh that's interesting and that doesn't rub you the wrong way it's sad because Brad Berry to safety is a discussion, even though he got injured and it reeks of desperation more than it does. This is going to work. You see this with Mekhi Becton. He, at one point, never wanted to move from the left side of the line, and he always wanted to play tackle, and he was never open and willing to move to any other position. Right tackle? No, no, no. Well, now his life in, in the NFL is pretty much on life support, and the only way for him to find any sort of buzz is if he's willing to move around. That's what what happens when you basically have no time left in the league so instead of pretending like James Bradbury's an automatic W at safety and by the way he gets injured on footwork drills and didn't even participate in anything else unless that was a move just because he's aware that the Eagles don't want him 
He's aware that Howie Roseman is picking up the phones trying to figure out trades, and they work together to to say, hey, you can play at safety. We'll show you at a high point and make it seem like you've been sensational back there in camp with some really eye-popping plays, and maybe that will intrigue and entice an outside team to call up. Maybe they work together. I don't know because James Bradbury is pretty aware that he, he doesn't have a crazy fit here. And then once he got a little tweaked, yo, I'm not pushing this. So it's less about this thing. Thing is so serious that it took him off the field for real for real and more about we got to play the long-term goal here and make sure that if you leave or if you want to leave that we you know keep you as upright as humanly possible I, I don't know but between that and Quinya Mitchell talking trash to AJ Brown about his route running there is some substance about what's going on in the field but let's be honest the takeaway really was the lack thereof when it comes to support from the quarterback to the head coach and uh, Brandon Graham's remarks. There's a lot here. So let's play the audio. This was Eagles quarterback Jalen Hurts, who was asked about Sirianni being open-minded to change with the offense and what it says about the head coach. So keep in mind, the quarterback had a golden opportunity. I would label this almost a layup, a layup to give love to Sirianni and say, look, a lot of people are stubborn in this league. I've been around a lot of coaches, and for the most part, you know, it, it's about what they love. This is what we do. This is how it goes, and to have some Somebody who is really willing to do what's best for the team and put the pride aside. And we saw it with Shane Steichen. And it's not about him and, and him getting all the love. It's about us and we getting all the love. And that's what makes Nick Sirianni so special. They pretty much put this on a golden plate for Jalen Hurts to show Nick Sirianni so much appreciation. And instead, this is what we got. Take a listen. So, what have you noticed about, you know, Nick being open-minded to change up every, you know, the offense like he has? I mean, what's that say about him? Um, I mean, it's a great question. I don't know that I know the answer to it. Well, what have you seen? What have you seen from him as far as doing that? Um, I think he's just, you know, he's been a, you know, great and um. You know, the, the messages he's delivering to the team. Um, he's trying to be very intentional in what he's saying. Um, and, yeah. Guys. Guys. That's horrible. Horrible. Am I taking too much out of a Jalen Hurts press conference? Here's why I say no. I'm not taking too much out of it and nitpicking it to death. Jalen Hurts is a smart, smart man. He is an extremely intelligent man. He is so prepared for what media attention is all about. It was drilled in his head from the Nick Saban experience. Rat poison, rat poison, rat poison, right? And they look at it as a a negative thing, media, this and that. But regardless, the point is, he's aware of the attention that media availability give to the team. Whether he thinks it's positive, negative, this and that. He knows what happens, the the conclusions that are drawn, the power that it has, especially in this market where not too long ago, A.J. Brown called into WIP to defend himself and to defend his teammates. What does it say that Nick Sirianni is willing to change the offense, knowing that last year wasn't very good? That's a great question. I don't know that I even know how to answer it. He's trying to be very intentional in what he's saying. He's trying to be. Is that an indication that he's giving his best effort, but it ain't working? He's neutered. And when you're trying to inspire 50-plus men, in this case, way more than that, obviously there's cuts to be made and people who aren't even going to make the team and things of that nature. But when everyone knows in the back of your mind that that man is useless right now, the words don't hit the same. I'm pretty positive 
I've used a similar example in the past. But let's resurface it if I haven't. Sometimes I talk too damn much. I don't even know what platform I've said it on. We all have that close friend. Maybe it's not a close friend anymore. A a, a friend at one particular time. Maybe even a family member. They did something to you previously or did something to someone previously and you move forward past it. But you never forget what actually happened. You don't bring it up anymore. You pretend you're over it. But it always stings when you see that person because you can't shake it. You know deep down what they did. And you could try and push past it all you want. Maybe you do and you'd be the better person and you just never bring it up again. But there's something that's just bothering you in the back of your mind. And what if that person had to rally you? What if that person had to had to coach you, had to inspire you, had to, you know, r- r- really get you going? But in the back of your mind, like, just shut, shut up. Shut up. You're a fraud. I can't trust you. Now, there's different layers to this and different levels to it, but I'm just trying to make it so it's personal, so you can draw your conclusions on how you'd react if it was somebody in your life because I'm pretty damn sure that everybody has somebody in their life where it's like, come on, you'll never forget. And last year's debacle and the stripping of all of his power... You'll never forget that big collapse of Sirianni, how everything was handled with the offense last year with Brian Johnson, how he had to remove himself from calling plays prior to that. This guy has an an extreme track record of having zero knowledge offensively and not knowing how to fix anything or even put anybody in the right places to succeed. Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown have quotes out there. Uh, Where is it? Um... The, the whoa, 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 did I have it on this page or did I write it in a, talking about freedom, talking about having options, uh, talking about uh, motion. This is an NFL offense for once. They were playing Pop Warner offense that six and seven-year-olds would try and run. It shouldn't be a big deal to talk about options, but it's a big deal to actually talk about having options. Because they barely even had anything incorporated into the damn offense when Nick Sirianni was at the helm. And yet, this guy is supposed to lead the men. Jalen Hurts. It's not only the, I don't know how to answer that, because that's a simple defend of the coach. He's trying to be very intentional in what he's saying. That's an indication that he's doing his best, but it ain't working. Now, this is a little bit longer of a clip. Maybe I'll stop it at some point because it's about a minute and 40 seconds and it's a little long for my liking. But not too long ago, we were informed that this was still going to be Nick Nick Sirianni's offense and they're going to utilize and incorporate a lot of what they did last year, but Kellen Moore is going to add his own flavor to it and all that stuff, right? Okay. Maybe they wanted public perception to be Nick Sirianni still had something to do with this. Hmm. Once again, Jalen Hurts is very intelligent. He knows that everything he says gets picked apart. He knows what was talked about with this offense previously, and he's aware that everything I just mentioned about still incorporating stuff from last year, just adding some flavor of Kellen Moore, Nick Sirianni's still an offensive-minded guy who's got a lot to say about what's happening in the offense. There's not a soul in this city that didn't hear those words in the past. Take a listen about what it's like trying to get this new offense going and, well, quite frankly, how much of this is new? You know, right now, it's been a um, been a lot of new uh, inventory in. Um, majority of it, you know, probably 95% of it being new. Um, hmm. And so it's just been, uh, been that process and it's been a fun process because you get to see um, what works uh, for other people, you know. The number of coaches that I've had um, since I've been here, I've been able to take in a lot of 
new knowledge and new understanding. And so um, I think the goal coming in was to, you know, learn Kellen's offense and hmm. master it. Hmm. Um, and I think that's been a process. And I think by the end of it, I want it to be mine um, and, and have it in, in my own way. Um, I think I think that's kind of a credit to, again, the, the, the lack of continuity um, with that and it being a, a thing where I've kind of had to um, take all these new things and new voices and um, still go out there and be successful and efficient. And so, so I think that's um, I think that's exactly what's going to happen again. All right, so we'll stop it there. 95% of this is basically new. I like the quote about wanting to make Kellen Moore's offense my offense, and, and that's great. That's the killer mentality that I would love. What does Nick Sirianni do? What does Nick Sirianni do? This isn't strange to anybody else. I don't know. I'm very uncomfortable. Very, very uncomfortable. Because I can't pretend like a, a head coach should be like this. I, I, I mean, come on, guys. Seriously? We have to pretend that Nick Sirianni is allowed to do nothing? We're allowed to have a head coach that does nothing? Let me draw something out for you. Imagine. Let's pretend this. Vic Fangio, very good. Kellen Moore, very good. Team is good. Maybe not the best we've ever seen, but a good team. Uh, I know last year they won 11 games, but how they got to those 11 games were a little bit wonky. So, uh, you know, they were 10-1. and one. They won 11 games. That's a disaster, okay? So let's say it was a, a solid 11-win season where it was just good football. You know, there's a bad loss, but then there's a good win, right? You lose a game at home that you should uh, win, and then you go on the road and you win a game that you probably should lose and whatever. But it's a it's a... Okay, 11 and, and 6, and it's it's fine. It's fine. But you did that without a role of a head coach. Well, could you have been a 12 or 13 win team if the ideas and concepts and the understanding of the game and the smartness, smartness and the intelligence of your head coach can give you a benefit, can give you an advantage, can give you an not an added bonus. It starts there. It should be an outstanding coach, and then your coordinators are the added bonus. It shouldn't be your coordinators are good, and then the head coach maybe can give you a little bit more. That's such a fraudulent way of attacking here. And, you know, I keep hearing this. Broats, if they win, should it matter how they get there? Yes. And no, because it is a results-based business. And if they win 13 games this year and Nick's just standing there with a big smile on his face, screaming up and down like a cheerleader, and Vic Fangio and Kellen Moore are both phenomenal, not just good, not just great, but phenomenal, and it carries them, and they could somehow overstep the problems and flaws of not having a head coach, should you be angry? No, no. But in that scenario, they should be 14 and three and uh, unbelievable. That's what it needs to be. If they're 15 and two and they are by far just elite, 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 then I won't complain about Nick. But I don't think that's who they're going to be. They'll probably be a 10 or 11 win team. And the lack of a head coach is the difference in being a 13 win team. And think about the difference between a 13 and a 10 win team. That's a difference in a, in a bit, in a, Big way. That's the difference in potentially hosting an NFC championship game or going on the road in the NFC championship game or not even winning a division or playing in the wild card. I mean, that is a massive swing. Having bye weeks, not having bye weeks. Come on. This is crazy to me. Just as crazy as what Brandon Graham said as well. And it's just another, my point is, this all happened with over the last 48 hours. Your veteran, BG, who we all love to death, and your quarterback, Jalen Hurts. Subconsciously, maybe consciously, I don't know how we got here, but it, 
the, the crazy part is, I, I have to think Jalen Hurts and his answer was intentional because he's just too smart. And same with BG to a degree. But BG did afterwards say something along the lines. I'm pretty sure I saw a quote say, hey, don't get me in trouble. So I almost am aware of, one, he was talking just honest from the gut because, well, he's been around long enough to not have to worry about that stuff. And then he realized as he was talking, ah, shit, <laughs> right? Or he knew what he was doing the whole way and then at the end said, yo, fellas, please, don't get me in trouble here. But reality is, Nick Sirianni doesn't do anything. Take a listen to Brandon Graham on the difference between this year's coaching staff and last year's staff. I, I really think that last year, um, we just didn't... We, we, that's what we didn't have. Uh, we didn't have all the right coaches in the right position, you know, I would say. And, you know, you can just see the guys just truly believing in what, what we got going on. And I'm excited for the young guys that just came in and new, new uh, rookies coming in. You just noticed little stuff uh, last year on certain stuff you wasn't on the same page about. Just here and there, uh, it will pop up, but it popped up in a big way that last game. And it's just like, if I, anything I learned, um, you always want to make sure that we just had a proper communication. So there's real big communication going on right now uh, within the locker room, within on the field, uh, in, in the classrooms. And, you know, I just I know how he was going to get it fixed, because uh, once you notice, you just got to deal with it during the year. And I mean, that's how it that's how it is. But I don't see none of that at all. I'm more excited about, um, you know, just because we do got Fangio, uh, somebody experienced real, real good. I'm not saying that. It, uh, anything about, you know, the, the past, but it was just more like, you know, you, you could just tell that everybody's on the same page about stuff. Okay, so obviously when you go through the disaster of last year, it's on the general manager to make a big impact and have some heavy swings in the offseason to make people feel good about the roster. And there's no doubt that they've improved C.J. Gardner-Johnson coming back. And, you know, there's a lot there that Howie did. But to talk about not having coaches in the right position and he knew that Howie was going to fix it. Look, <laughs> part of being a good coach is building a good staff. It's just what it is. Part of being a good coach is having the ability to build a good staff. Now, you can make the argument that in years past, Jim Schwartz was hired before Doug. They won a Super Bowl. My point is, there is a, some some reasonable years to look back at and say, well, this is how the Eagles do it. Lori and um, Howie, you know, Andy Reid was different. But once he got through the Andy Reid, and really the Chip Kelly era, because after the Chip Kelly era, I think they gave too much power away. They realized that we can't do that. We have to reel it back in. And Doug wanted to keep Mike Rowe. He wanted Press Taylor. The Eagles said, this guy's not good enough. And maybe the Eagles were right. Or maybe Doug Peterson was right. I thought the Eagles were right to say, yo, Doug, we love you to death, but you're a stunad, and there's no way that we're going down with with, uh, the ship sinking because you're a big Mike Rowe guy. Like, watch the offense. Look at it. It's unacceptable. But at some point, I do feel the, once again, the advantage that you get for a head coach, it might not just be on game day with X's and O's and this and that just from a from your scheme level, but from the culture you build within your, your coaching staff. Like, that is a big deal. And if now we're removing that from the head coach responsibility is you, know, you don't even choose your own coaches. You don't do that. How will you fix it? Coaches weren't in the right place. So that either indicates that – did Nick Sirianni have the ability to go, yo, I want Brian Johnson here? Maybe they would have went. Now, I defended the natural progression because what you normally do is make a, a, a quarterback's coach an offensive coordinator. And the whole organization was high on Brian Johnson and the relationship between Brian Johnson and, and Jalen Hurts was strong. So maybe Howie Roseman was the one to select Brian Johnson and say, hey, it's fine. But knowing that Nick Sirianni is willing to go down with his guys, I'd imagine that he said, yo, I love the idea of Brian Johnson. Let's run it. And maybe there is a world where Nick Sirianni Sirianni say, yeah, I want Brian Johnson here. I, I I want Sean Desai here. This is what we want. And then one year later, here's BG going. Because keep in mind, Nick Sirianni just went to the Super Bowl. Things were looking good. Jalen Hurts out, uh, 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 Pat Mahomes in the bowl. Like, 
You know, the, everything was looking good. So maybe they were open to uh, giving him some wiggle room. And he goes, yeah, let's go with Brian Johnson. Yeah, let's go with Sean Desai. Let's get this thing rolling here. And, uh, you know, here's Brandon Graham a year later saying how he had to fix things. So it's not impossible that after Nick Sirianni picked his guys after a good year at the Super Bowl run, the GM has to strip him of his power of even having thoughts on who his staff is. I'm not just making things up. These are real and smacking us in the face. When it's so much smoke, because, you know, well, you're nitpicking this. Well, you're saying this. Well, it's that. Well, yeah, that's my point. It's six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven things. It's not just one. And it's Hurts. It's Brandon Graham. It's it's Howie. It's Laurie. It's this. It's that. Come on, people. There's a problem here. There's a real problem here. And at some point, the blame's got to go to Howie and Laurie. Because if Nick stinks, then don't worry about public perception on firing another coach because that's why he's here. I love Lori to death. And by the way, potentially selling steak? Interesting. Interesting. (laughs) He's here because they wanted to save face. We'll see if it pays off dividends. I think they're trying to cover up the issue at head coach with the coaching staff around them. It should be the other way around. It should be your head coach is so good, and then you just add the complimentary pieces around him. Instead, they're trying to get all the firepower that a head coach provides throughout 17 coaches, and then Nick's just standing there with a Phillies hat on. It's unbelievable. All right, everybody. Love you to death. Appreciate it. Talk to you on the next one.